All right, everybody, this is John Allen Gay. I'm the head of the John Quincy Adams Society. Uh, we are a national network of student organizations and professionals who are in the foreign policy space uh, or interested in foreign policy careers or just have a strong interest in the U.S. approach to the world in general. Uh, and we have a centering vision of a U.S. foreign policy that, in the words of John Quincy Adams, uh, goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. It's more careful, uh, more measured. Uh, and needless to say, a lot of people in our organization are interested in public service and in the kinds of jobs where you might be required to get a security clearance. And for a lot of people, that's kind of a mysterious and even somewhat threatening, uh, scary thing. It's There's not a lot of information out there. It's all kind of in bits and pieces and on forums in various places. So I wanted to just lay out some of the details of the security clearance process, what they are, and, and what you can expect, what they're looking at. We're going to go over real quick here what security clearances are, why you would need one, what the investigations are really going to be focusing on, how the actual process from beginning the investigation to the decision about the investigation is generally going to work, and then how you as a young professional or especially a college student can start preparing to make that process a little easier. So first off, what are they? Above all, it's about determining that you are eligible to access very sensitive information pertaining to US national security. Uh, and it's gonna be based on an overall judgment about your trustworthiness and character. So from uh, an executive order that outlines the clearance process. It says eligibility for access to classified information shall be granted only to employees who are United States citizens for whom an appropriate investigation has been completed and whose personal and professional history affirmatively indicates loyalty to the United States, strength of character, trustworthiness, et cetera, et cetera, as well as freedom from conflicting allegiances and potential for coercion and willingness to abide uh, by the regulations governing the use, handling, and protection of classified information. So, you know, just a, a few quick things to highlight here. In addition to the trustworthiness, they want to make sure that you're someone who actually is loyal to the United States. So there's both a requirement that you be a citizen and uh, that you not have some kind of obvious allegiance to another country uh, and that you not be subject to potential blackmail and also that you're good at following the rules because a lot of protecting classified information actually involves just following some seemingly onerous rules to the letter. The way it's going to work is there's an investigative process that they're going to use to make a determination. And then if you get it and you start working in a field that requires a clearance, it's going to be renewed pretty regularly. In general, the, uh, the legal criterion is going to be every five years. And as you'll notice, when I go through a lot of the categories here, there's going to be areas that are pretty clearly mostly focused on people who are already handling classified information in their day-to-day -day life. Another important thing to know is that they're not going to immediately give you access to like all the secrets. So if you think like, oh man, I'm going to find out what happens in Area 51 or something like that, no, it's, it's based on your need to know sensitive information. Uh, and so it'll probably be very much tied to your specific job. And another thing to think about is a lot of people think, oh man, you have to be this perfect angel to get a security clearance. Uh, so if you've done one dumb thing in your entire life, uh, then you're not eligible. And that's that's really a myth. It's a misconception. Uh, so it's important to remember that about 1.3 million Americans have clearances at the top secret level. Uh, and that's uh, it's pretty much evenly split between the federal and the contractor uh, 
labor force, and it's about 0.8% of the total American workforce has a top secret level security clearance. Uh, so needless to say, there are all sorts of people from all sorts of backgrounds uh, who have successfully gotten security clearances. So you shouldn't feel like you're totally disqualified just because, you know, you drank a beer out of the fridge when you were 13 or something like that. What are they looking for overall? It's information suggesting that it would be really risky to give you very sensitive information. Uh, needless to say, uh, there's a lot of information that the government has that other governments or terrorist organizations, folks like that are working very, very hard to obtain. Things that could give them an advantage in a war, things that could give them an edge in negotiations. You know, it's, it's a dog-eat-dog uh, -dog world out there, and that's particularly true when it comes to things affecting espionage. Uh, so it's not just about whether you're trustworthy, it's whether you're vulnerable, whether you exhibit patterns of behavior uh, in certain areas that can pose a risk. Uh, in general, people talk about mice as one of the common sets of motivations for spying money uh, and that includes just wanting lots more money wanting a really luxurious lifestyle beyond what you can afford and therefore maybe a foreign intelligence agency can give you some money uh, and in return for information or maybe you're really in debt or you have like a gambling problem or something like that and you need the money uh, Another aspect is ideology. This can include stuff like in the Cold War, uh, being a, a, a sympathizer to the Soviet Union. Nowadays, maybe being a member of Al Qaeda, uh, or it can also include national allegiance. So if you're more loyal to South Africa than the United States, uh, that would more or less fall under, under the ideology category as an espionage risk. And then compromise and coercion. In general, this is going to mean blackmail, uh, a foreign intelligence agency threatening to release derogatory information about you uh, or harm someone, something like that, where they're going to try to force you to give them information that you have access to. And then an overlooked category is actually ego. Uh, a lot of spies in recent history have been motivated by feeling superior to people around them, by uh, a desire to pull stuff off and get away with it just because they think they're better than everybody, uh, various things like that. So those are some of the common motives. And when we go through the categories they're looking at, you'll pretty quickly see how a lot of them map onto these. And then finally, before we really dig into the process, uh, it's important to know that each determination about security clearance is going to be made individually and based on your unique circumstances. Everybody is different. Everybody's going to have different areas uh, of focus. So it's kind of a, an overall holistic judgment that they're going to be making. What are the investigations going to be looking for? Uh, this is drawn from a public document from 2008, a uh, policy guidance document for the intelligence community. You can find it. Uh, I'll link it in the description on the video. Uh, and it has 13 key areas of focus that we're going to run through real quick here uh, that where you could have potentially concerning behavior and it's also going to look at how they evaluate. How is that potential uh, negative conduct in one of these categories going to be looked at? It's not just like, oh, you did this thing, you're out. No way. No, it's, it's actually going to be evaluating the seriousness, the recency, uh, the motivations, whether you're likely to do it again. There's a lot of different factors that they're going to be examining. Again, they're trying to build a holistic picture of you. It's not going to be really hard and fast. So let's just go through the categories real quick here. So the first one is allegiance to the United States. 
uh, and that's are you loyal to the United States and are you actually like working against the US government? So a lot of these are pretty obvious. You know, you're not likely to get a security clearance if you're a, uh, a member of ISIS. Uh, it, if you look at the definitions in this category, uh, it, it's stuff that's just really glaringly obvious. If you're hanging out with terrorists, if you're engaging in acts of sabotage against the U.S. government, uh, if you're working with organizations that are trying to overthrow the government by violence or are trying to suppress voting by illegal means, uh, that's really going to be a, a pretty fundamental impediment. Um, there are some cases where people will not realize what an organization stands for and then will stop standing for it. Uh, or you might be involved with an organization that has multiple elements to it and some of them are not doing these illegal things. But in general, uh, I, I don't think this is going to impact too many college students. Next, uh, foreign influence. So what this is looking for is whether you have some kind of vulnerability to manipulation or coercion stemming from your connections to stuff outside the United States. And typically that's gonna come through uh, some sort of divided loyalty, uh, such as a really close personal connection overseas uh, where you might feel that you're being forced to choose between that person and the interests of the U.S. government and where there's a doubt that you would put the uh, U.S. government and your obligation to protect sensitive information, uh, where there's a doubt that you'd put that first. Uh, and so this can also include some foreign financial interests. Uh, I'm guessing most of our younger members don't really have to worry about that. I think the key is uh, ties to foreign individuals, uh, if there's a heightened risk through that connection to foreign exploitation, inducement, manipulation, pressure, et cetera. Uh, so for example, uh, in countries that are hostile to the United States, if you have relatives there uh, and that country has a pattern of trying to leverage uh, Americans into giving up sensitive information, uh, perhaps by threatening their relatives, that's something that they're going to want to dig into. Um, the, the real key here is to properly report the ties. Uh, during the investigation process, you'll have an opportunity to describe the nature of your foreign connections. Because uh, if, if you think about it, there aren't going to be a lot of people uh, who are going to be really strong candidates to be, say, a intelligence analyst covering India uh, if they've never been to India or met any Indian people. Uh, you know, there's a real benefit in having done stuff like studied abroad, uh, even if it might create uh, some challenges in the investigation, uh, it's also going to make you a much stronger candidate for the job. And, you know, trust me, there are lots of people who have been all kinds of places overseas and met all kinds of people who get security clearances. Otherwise, it would be a, uh, a really ineffective system for getting the best people. Another is foreign preference. So this is about whether you have another country that your ties to it suggest you might put that country first. Uh, so it's a key is that it is not a measurement of loyalty to the United States. Holding dual citizenship is not in itself a sign of foreign preference or even being eligible for foreign citizenship. Uh, what is more likely to draw focus is if you're hiding your foreign uh, citizenship, if you've secretly got a foreign passport, if you've obviously renounced your U.S. citizenship, uh, if you're doing things that suggest that you're really more uh, tied to that country than to the United States. And that can include things like seeking political office or having military service. Um, on a lot of these categories, stuff like uh, being clearly, ha having clear family ties here in the U.S., clear involvement in your community in the U.S., those are going to be the kinds of things that will mitigate some of these concerns because they're going to show that, oh, yeah, you're mostly an American. Uh, and also, if 
it's with countries that are really low risk. You know, if you've got a cousin in Britain uh, that you've never met uh, or that maybe you see at weddings uh, and that's about it, that's going to be viewed very differently than if it, you have like an uncle who you go live with every summer and they work for the KGB. You know, that's kind of an example of what we're dealing with here. Next, uh, sexual behavior. Uh, one key thing to flag at the beginning here, since the 1990s, uh, sexual orientation has not been grounds for denying a clearance or anything like that. Uh, the actual concern that they're focused on is behavior that's illegal. Uh, so like things like uh, prostitution, uh, sexual assault, stuff like that, engaging in behavior that's against the law. Uh, stuff that suggests that you have some kind of underlying personality disorder, uh, things that could make you vulnerable to blackmail. So, for instance, having an affair uh, is not smart, uh, and if it's maybe in public. Uh, and then one of the things you're going to see here in the mitigating factors is that a standard that's going to apply for pretty much all of these remaining categories it's if the behavior was long ago, infrequent, or under unusual circumstances, so that it's unlikely to recur and does not cast doubt on your current reliability. Again, we're going to see this again and again and again, and that's an example of this isn't about having a completely perfect past. It's about being reliable in the present and in the future and not vulnerable to uh, blackmail or coercion. Next, your personal conduct. So this is going to be looking for patterns of behavior that show that you're not showing sound judgment, not being honest, not playing by the rules. Uh, one of the main ones here is just if you're not honest in the clearance process uh, or you're refusing to provide certain information that's relevant to it, that's obviously going to be a huge red flag. Uh, Another factor is unauthorized releases of information at your workplace. Obviously, this is more of concern if you're actually already handling classified information. But in some cases, you know, if you're working at a, a law firm or a financial services firm, uh, you might deal with confidential customer information. And so that's going to be something that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're handling it responsibly, that's a good thing in this category. Um, and then also just in general activities that you're engaged in that if they were made publicly known could harm your reputation. That's obviously the, the basis of blackmail uh, or doing things overseas that are legal there, illegal here, illegal there, legal here, that could potentially open you up to targeting by a foreign intelligence service. Uh, and of course, don't hang out with lots of criminals. Financial considerations, uh, this is, uh, I think, a lot, one a lot of students have a lot of questions around, uh, since a lot of folks have student loans. Uh, the key here is that it's about failing to live within your means and meet your financial obligations, and uh, that, you know, you need to be a trustworthy, responsible person with your money, because otherwise it could open you up to all kinds of vulnerabilities. Uh, in general, it's more about repaying your loans on time uh, than it is about not having significant amounts of loans. Uh, and you're going to build a financial track record as your life goes on. So I wouldn't sweat this too much. Uh, just try to just make sure you're paying your loans on time. If you're not, uh, try to establish a clear financial plan, maybe with a financial professional that will help show that you have a clear path out of uh, out of this issue. And then of course, you know, don't be doing things with money that suggest a lack of integrity, like evading your taxes or uh, engaging in fraud, you know, writing bad checks on purpose, uh, that kind of thing. Next up, uh, another popular one with college students, alcohol consumption. So the focus here is on uh, things that show that you have a pattern of losing control and putting yourself in a vulnerable position, uh, one where you're not exercising sound judgment due to heavy consumption of alcohol. 
So obviously stuff like DUIs, stuff like uh, police interactions, uh, showing up to work drunk, uh, habitual or binge consumption to the point of impaired judgment, uh, and then of course things related to actually being diagnosed with alcohol abuse or dependence disorders. Um, as usual, the standard about uh, the behavior being long ago or infrequent or unusual, that's something that's going to be taken into account. Uh, and if you have had like a serious alcohol problem, the fact that you're taking steps to overcome it, if you were an alcohol dependent, uh, abstaining, or if you were just abusing it, using it responsibly, those are the sorts of things uh, that can put you in a better position. A somewhat stronger concern is drug involvement. Uh, so this is uh, illegal drugs, uh, prescription drugs, stuff like sniffing glue. Uh, again, one element of this is that it's about losing control versus being in control. Uh, it's important to note that this decision is handled on the basis of federal law, not state law. Uh, you know, I live in DC, I've been to Colorado, uh, and if you go to those places, it sure looks like marijuana is legal, but in fact, federally, marijuana is just as illegal as it was in the past. So you'll want to not be partaking in that. Um, and again, there are uh, potential mitigating factors here, uh, especially stopping using drugs, not hanging out with people who are using drugs, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious, and the longer of a pattern of not using drugs you've established, the better a chance you've got. So psychological issues. Uh, again, this is about the person's judgment, uh, reliability, their trustworthiness. Uh, it, it's very important to note that seeking uh, counseling or psychological help is not itself uh, under the regulation a cause for concern. Uh, as you might have imagined, a lot of people in the military or the intelligence world encounter things that could be disturbing, could create psychological issues, and so uh, there has to be a little bit of flexibility in this area. They're, and also they're going to be using qualified mental health professionals to help inform their judgments when they're making decisions in this category. Uh, key concerns are going to be around emotionally unstable, irresponsible, dysfunctional, violent, paranoid, or bizarre behavior, uh, or just in general an opinion by a psychological professional that you're not able to uh, exercise proper judgment or reliability or trustworthiness. Um, and that said, there are a lot of mitigating factors here tied to the condition being under control or in recovery or done, uh, or maybe it was from something that was temporary or it's just being well managed. Criminal conduct. Uh, Unsurprisingly, another area of concern, uh, serious crimes or a pattern of smaller crimes, being accused of crimes, regardless of whether you were actually charged, uh, being on parole or probation, having parole violations, all of these are potential issues. And again, they're going to apply a lot of the same standards that they've applied in these other domains. And the focus is going to be on whether you've uh, turned your life around uh, or, in fact, whether, uh, in the words of Shaggy, it wasn't me, you didn't do it. Uh, if there's evidence of that, that also is, needless to say, going to be taken into consideration. And then this gets back to, uh, to some of the stuff in the personal conduct category, handling protected information. As you're going to see, in most cases, this isn't going to really apply unless you are already in uh, the intelligence community or a similar organization where you're going to be handling a lot of sensitive information. So outside activities, this one is about 
things you're doing outside of work that could uh, create an issue of unauthorized disclosures of information uh, or create some kind of conflict of interest. Uh, it's really going to be a big red flag if you're working for a foreign government uh, or for some other kind of foreign interest. Uh, or if you're doing things like uh, engaging in public writing about national security affairs, uh, this is that does that's not to say that you can't do it. It's more that especially if you've already got access to classified information, they're going to want to know about this. This is something that they wouldn't want you to be doing secretly. Uh, and there's a in the regulation, the real focus is on the determination that the security officials make about whether this does or does not create a conflict of interest. Uh, and if it doesn't, then you've stopped doing it. Use of IT systems. Uh, again, this is because a lot of sensitive information is handled through uh, information technology systems. Uh, the one key that I would flag for college students is illegal downloading, uh, illegal copying of files. Uh, this is something that's definitely a, uh, a red flag uh, under these standards. And so if you're doing it, you should probably stop. How does this process work? Uh, there's really three phases. Uh, there's a great uh, report on the details of the process that I've cited at the bottom here, and I'll put a link uh, in the description. This is a uh, primer on security clearances from the National Security Institute at George Mason University. In short, there's three real steps. You fill out a form. They use the form to do an investigation. They look at the results of the investigation to determine whether you should get a security clearance. The form that they're going to use is called the SF-86, the Standard Form 86. You can find this online. Nowadays, a lot of it is going to be done through an automated system rather than through a paper copy. But as you can see, it covers a lot of the, uh, the same categories that we've just been talking about. And it's going to be pulling together information that will help conduct an investigation to make sure that you're telling the truth. Uh, and when in the information that you're giving them and to make sure that you're a, an upstanding person who can be trusted. The investigation itself is going to be conducted almost always by an, an element of the Office of Personnel Management, OPM, uh, called the National Background Investigation Bureau. Uh, they're going to take the form that you've filled out and use that as kind of a starting point. They'll also look at public records, credit reports, arrest records, things like that. Uh, you'll be identifying a lot of personal contacts in, uh, in these forms, and they might interview some of those contacts uh, in order to ask them questions about whether, uh, whether you're telling the truth, you know, whether uh, you have a pattern of, you know, associating with criminals or any of these other issues. Uh, I've, I know I've been interviewed by a couple of these people in the past, and, uh, you know, it's often just questions like, uh, you know, is, is that person that you know, are they, uh, uh, are they a person that you think should be trusted? And, it, it, you know, the, the times I've been interviewed, it's often lasted less than five or ten minutes. Um, Something that a lot of people worry about is one of the next phases, they'll interview you, and it typically involves a lie detector, the polygraph. All I would say is don't do research on it and don't worry too much about it. Uh, it's really just to augment the questions that they're asking you, and it's more about answering the questions truthfully uh, than about what some readout on a machine says. Uh, the clearance process can also take a very long time. There have very often been backlogs and delays in the clearance process, just because if, if you can imagine, you know, doing this on literally tens of thousands of people every year is a very large enterprise. And so it's 
it can take quite a while. We generally advise people to avoid uh, putting all their eggs in one basket on a cleared job, simply because in addition to the clearance process itself, there are so many other elements of uncertainty. So for example, unless you've got a clear start date, uh, you probably shouldn't just like up and move to Washington because you want to work for, uh, say, the State Department uh, or the CIA or some other organization like that in, it, until it's really clear that it's actually happening because it'll typically start with a conditional job offer and that's where a lot of this investigation is going to be happening and it can take quite a while. Um, occasionally there will be interim clearances granted, but a lot of times that's for people and stuff like working in the White House. Once they've finished up the investigation, uh, they're going to make a decision based on the overall report that the investigators prepare. And again, it's going to be a holistic decision that's going to be looking at all of these different categories and making an overall read on what, how trustworthy you are and how trustworthy you're likely to be in the future. So that doesn't really end the process. Once you've been given the access and started your job, you'll have further briefings on how to properly handle classified information and be given rules on uh, how to protect the information. And if you're in a special program uh, that involves compartmented information or a uh, special access program, there might be additional briefings that are particular to that type of information. Uh, again, you know, there are elements of information that not everybody has access to just because they get a clearance. Um, you'll probably have to sign a non-disclosure agreement uh, and a pre-publication uh, review agreement, which is basically uh, for the rest of your life. You can't be going and telling the secrets that you've learned uh, and you can't uh, write about them. And if you're writing about stuff that's related to the areas where you were working with secret information, you'll have to provide that writing uh, to the agency you work for to make sure that you're not even inadvertently leaking classified information. And again, this process will get to happen again and again. How can you get ready uh, for a process like this? The most obvious one is don't lie. Uh, if you have stuff when we were going through these categories and you thought, oh boy, I, I, uh, I did something that is going to come up there. Uh, just disclose it, uh, when in doubt, air it out. Uh, that's really step one. Uh, second, I would say if you're currently doing things that would qualify uh, under some of these categories, stop because uh, the longer that you have not been doing them and the more clearly you turned your life around, uh, the easier it's going to be and the more likely that it will be adjudicated in your favor. Uh, I wouldn't advise people to worry too, too much about foreign contacts or traveling to foreign countries. The focus is really on not hiding stuff. Again, they aren't necessarily looking for people who have never met any foreigners. Uh, or been to foreign countries to be experts on the overseas world. Uh, so just keep track of that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the real focus is on close and continuing relationships that someone could use against you. Uh, I'd also say look at the SF-86. Again, you can download it, you just Google it, and look at the information that's required on it. You could even fill one out and keep it someplace safe because that will uh, enable you to move a lot more quickly if you actually are in a clearance process because often what will happen is you'll apply, you'll maybe do an interview, you'll not hear anything for a long time and then suddenly out of the blue you'll get a request to fill out like 30 forms in a week. And so if you've got that information already partly assembled, it's going to make it a lot easier. What information do you need to retain? Uh, you're going to want to zero in on names, addresses, and contact info for your former roommates, your former landlords, 
and places that you've worked, including internships, overall what you're trying to do is build a complete uh, verifiable account of your life from age 18 on. And the focus is on uh, having people who can testify that yes, you know, they lived in this place, uh, they behaved in this way, I actually knew this person, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, or just, yeah, this person was a resident at the apartment building that I own. I think one important area to focus in on is study abroad. Uh, make sure that you have, uh, you know, a friend or someone from there that you stay in touch with. And one of the things you can do to actually get some of this information is like send people Christmas cards. Uh, it's, it's a nice way to stay in touch with people and it will let you uh, have that information for that person. So that's, that wraps it up. Uh, again, the John Quincy Adams Society, you can find out more about careers uh, in international affairs, about U.S. grand strategy, uh, smarter paths forward for our foreign policy, uh, and you can get involved in one of our student chapters or our professional network at jqas.org. Thank you very much.